Hello, and welcome to the video lecture, Perspectives in Psychology, entitled Synapses and Synaptic Plasticity. So this is the session, um, moving my microphone, this is the session where uh, we'll start talking about the brain and the nervous system in a little more detail, which will set us up for understanding how physiological psychologists have studied uh, learning and memory. And so I'm going to take you back uh, historically thinking about anatomists, early anatomists who were trying to understand the nervous system. The nervous system was actually um, far more difficult to understand than other tissue in the body. So if you look at some of these pictures up here, these are microscope slides taken from um, various regions of the body. This is muscle right here. On the far right here is skin cells, and I honestly can't remember what I grabbed here. Kidney, liver, could be any of those, okay? And the point I'm trying to make is that if you were an anatomist in, uh, back in the 1700s or something, and, uh, and that, at that time you, were, you had microscopes, you were able to make thin sections through tissue, you have to make really thin sections, otherwise the light won't get up through the tissue. So you're always dealing with a tiny little bit of tissue when you're trying to study it. And they had dyes, they had uh, stains that they could apply to the tissue that would differentiate different parts of the cells so they could start to study them. And the point I wanna make is when you're studying muscle or skin or whatever the heck this is, um, what you can see in that thin slice is pretty much everything. So muscle cells are long rectangular cells that have typically several, um, areas of staining in them, which are the nuclei of the cells. These cells here, like a lot of cells in the body, are triangular shaped. These cells here are kind of elliptically shaped. But the nervous system, we don't have cells like that, okay? In the nervous system, and, and this is a, a video that was uh, made, that was showing off a new technique in which all of the cell membranes of the nervous system, which are hard to see through, were replaced by a clear substance. And the neurons, um, which are the cells of the nervous system, were filled with a fluorescent dye. So you could actually hold up this brain. It would look like clear jello. And you could see right into it. And you could see these neurons that are filled with this green dye moving their way through the nervous system. And the point I'm trying to make is that neurons don't sit in a nice flat plane. And they're not so small that you can see their whole shape in the tiny view of a microscope. Instead, neurons have parts that, that wind their way through the nervous system. Some neurons are incredibly large. They, they're connecting from one side of the brain to the other. Um, they're connecting from the one side of the brain all the way down to the spinal cord. So there's no way to cut through a section of nervous system, put it under a microscope, and understand what you're looking at. This part of the video here shows a part of the human brain that's been applied with the same technique where all the cell membranes have been replaced by a clear substance. So you can literally hold up this part of the brain and look at it with the naked eye. And different types of cells using some fancy neuroscience techniques have been filled with different colored fluorescent dyes. And this is actually human hippocampus here. So even within the hippocampus, it would be very difficult to study the connections of well, it'd be very difficult to see a whole neuron and then how that neuron was connecting to other neurons within the brain um, in days before this kind of technology, meaning in days before 1990 or 1995, whenever this technology was invented. So the nervous system was very difficult to study. And in fact, that led to debates about whether the nervous system was different from skin, muscle, liver, kidney, in that maybe the nervous system didn't have cells. So for a long time, Many people argued that the nervous system is just one interconnected web. There aren't individual cells, and that's why we feel like we're one person. We're, we, we are, are um, we feel unified. We, we don't feel like we're composed of lots of individual cells. Um, and so there were people who strongly believed that that was the case. And it wasn't really until the late 1800s even early 1900s, that the controversy was finally settled, that we had good enough stains, good enough microscopes, that it became clear that the nervous system, like other tissue in the body, is 
composed of individual cells, but those cells have very different shapes than rectangles, triangles, or circles, and that those shapes were really important to understand in order to understand how neurons functioned. So the human brain consists of about 86 billion cells called neurons, plus another 86 trillion cells called glia cells. Glia cells are from a Latin word that means glue, because the early anatomists who could see these glial cells, glial cells would often either wrap around neurons or they would um, send extensions that would wrap around blood vessels and would sort of combine, seem to hold neurons together and hold neurons to the blood vessels, etc. So um, they were, glial cells were kind of written off as um, structural support early in the anatomy of the nervous system. We now know that glial cells have a variety of functions, but it really is the neurons that do the work of processing information. So we still believe that neurons are the primary um, cell type of the nervous system that would do interesting things that would be related to behavior. And the glial cells, in addition to offering structural support, offer a variety of support like um, removing waste products from the nervous system, feeding neurons by bringing them energy and doing various roles in making sure that the environment of neurons is conducive to the neurons primary job, which is sending electrical signals to one another that will eventually result in some sort of behavior. So that that's what makes them interesting to, um, to psychologists, right? So if you look at this picture of human brain here, um, which has been cut horizontally, and you look down, there are sort of three different types of things that you can see here. There are spaces in the nervous system here and here, which are called ventricles. There's also one here. So these are the lateral, you don't have to know this, but these are the lateral ventricles. This is the third ventricle. Um, these are parts of the nervous system that are full of fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And um, they're very prominent structures that you can see on MRI images of, of the human brain. Um, more importantly, you've got these brown areas and these white areas. The brown areas are called gray matter. Um, I, I don't know why they're, I guess in preserved tissue, they look a little more gray and they look a little more brown in fresh, fresh tissue. And then the white areas are called white matter. So if you've heard the terms gray matter and white matter, it's referring to these color distinctions that you can see with the naked eye. Um, but we'll see in a few slides that the areas of, of gray matter are one part of the neuron, the cell bodies and the dendrites, and the areas of white matter are another part of the neuron, which are called the axons. And we'll see what those parts of the neurons are in a little bit. The reason that white matter looks white is not because axons are white. Um, axons are brown, just like the cell bodies and dendrites of the neurons are but the axons are wrapped in an insulation which is created by these glial cells and that insulation looks white to the naked eye. So that's just gray matter and white matter. But where you see white matter, you know those are connections. This is a very, again, you don't have to know this. We're not doing any brain anatomy in this class other than the areas of the brain that we mentioned that are related to memory, uh, which we, like hippocampus. And we'll, we'll talk about um, some other structures as well. But this big, um, thick area of white matter here is called the corpus callosum and it is the part of the brain that connects the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere um, and you can see lots of other white matter tracks here that are carrying information from one part of the brain to another or from the brain to the spinal cord uh, this stream right here is called the internal capsule and that's white matter that's coming taking information from the brain and sending commands down to the spinal cord that would be involved in movement. And we're kind of going to talk about those commands a little bit in today's class. Um, okay, so there's 86 billion neurons and neurons, that means that neurons are separate from one another. There are cells, they don't actually touch one another. And so although neurons are capable of generating these electrical signals called action potentials, which you read about in your reading, um, once that, that action potential, that electrical signal only works within the neuron, the, there's no spark that jumps to the next neuron. Otherwise your brain would heat up and it would, 
probably wouldn't last very long. So um, when the signal gets down to the end of the neuron, the point of that message is to allow that neuron to communicate with the next neuron, but they don't do so through sending electrical shocks to one another. They do so by releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, you probably heard the names of many of them, acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, um, lots of different endorphins. There's lots of different neurotransmitters in the uh, central nervous system, several dozen molecules. And when those neurotransmitters are released by one neuron, in order for them to communicate a message to the next neuron, the next neuron has to interact with those neurotransmitters in some way. And they do so by expressing molecules called neurotransmitter receptors. Now, we're not going to go heavy into the details of um, the neuroscience of how neurons work. If you, if, when you want to learn about that stuff, you should take my physiological psychology class, which is being offered in fall of 2020. Um, and the uh, prerequisites for that course are this class in Statistics and Research Methods 2. So if you can't take that in the fall, maybe you'll take that and it's typically offered every fall. So we're not going to go heavy into those details. And in fact, the reading that you did for today's class goes into more detail than you're going to need to know for the exam. Um, what you're going to need to know for the exam is basically the stuff that we cover in this lecture. Um, so there's extra stuff in the reading that, that we won't go, go into those details. But but what we do need to know in order to study memory and to understand what we're going to talk about when it comes to memory in the following couple of classes is this process that electrical signals are sent within neurons, neurotransmitters are released between neurons, and neurotransmitter receptors bind to those neurotransmitter molecules. And that will cause something to happen in the receiving neuron that might make it more likely for those neurons to send the message on further or less likely for those neurons to send a message. The neurotransmitters, when they, when they bind to the receptor, are carrying one of two messages, either an excitatory message, which is encouraging the next neuron to send its own electrical signal, or an inhibitory message, which is discouraging the next neuron from sending its own electrical signal. And everything that emerges from the nervous system, that is all the behaviors that we engage in, are produced by decisions that are made between neurons whether or not to send on a message. So if the excitatory signals win out over the inhibitory signals, the message is going to be transmitted. If the inhibitory signals win out over the excitatory signals, then this message is not going to be transmitted. Pretty much all of our behavior can be described by that process which seems too simple to produce complicated behavior of intelligent creatures, but you should remember that this process is taking place over as many as 86 billion neurons, and the points of connection where one neuron is communicating with another neuron is called a synapse. A synapse is the space between two neurons where one neuron is sending a signal to the other. And it's been estimated that there are about 100 trillion synapses in the central nervous system of, the, of a human. So that's a lot of places whereby excitatory or inhibitory signals can be transmitted. Not only that, but the state of a synapse can change every millisecond or so. So over the course of a second, I don't even know if I know the word. Yeah, I guess it's quadrillion. Over the course of a second, there might be something like a hundred quadrillion different states that your brain, that your synapses could be going through over that time period. So there's an enormous amount of computational complexity that emerges from your nervous system based on very simple signals, either excitatory or inhibitory signals that are being sent at any one place at any one time at any one millisecond. And I think it was learning about that just being overwhelmed by how much complexity there is. I mean, it's been, it's been said many times that the human brain is the most complex machine in the universe. And, and you'll hear a statement like that. And it, it, I don't know if that sounds plausible to you or not. But to me, it became plausible when I learned there's 100 trillion synapses in the human brain. 
and those synapses could be either active or not active about 100 times a second. That's a lot of computational power, um, even for something that you could write off as being a machine. Um, it's a pretty powerful machine. All right, so I've thrown out some terms, but you've read about these terms. So let's just make sure that we understand the terminology. Neurons are, and, and this is a possible picture of a neuron, but as I emphasize in my physiological psychology class, neurons are very diverse. They, they come in many shapes and sizes. <clears throat> and so putting a neuron up on the screen, don't assume that all neurons look similar to this, okay? This is just one example. And there are exceptions to every, every rule in the nervous system. However, and even here I qualified most neurons, um, most neurons have four major domains. And it really is most neurons. I mean, almost every neuron has these four domains. There are exceptions, but, but it's generally true. Um, and those four major domains are the dendrites. The dendrites comes from a word meaning tree, because it, I think it's a Greek word meaning tree, uh, because it looked like branches are coming off of the neuron. If you can think of this part of the neuron here, this triangle with a nucleus in the middle, as looking like other cells, then neurons seem to be different because they have this long thing coming off of them and these branches coming off of them. And it's that part that, those parts that it would be very difficult to see under a microscope without some, some fancy techniques being used. Um, okay, so, so these things look like branches. They're called dendrites. Um, this is where information comes into this neuron. So this is where the neurotransmitter receptors would be located. And if I can go back for a second, if you remember the math here, that there are um, 86 billion neurons, but 100 trillion synapses, that means each neuron itself has more than 1,000 synapses on it, okay? So that's where these 1,000 synapses are. It's mostly on dendrites. And there may be lots of different connections coming from different neurons. It, it could be hundreds of different neurons sending information to this one cell. And so to have enough space to listen to all of these inputs, these dendrites grow out to provide places for other neurons to come in and communicate with them. Some neurons receive lots of input, and so they have massive dendritic trees, as they're called. And some neurons have a more restricted um, amount of input, and so their, their dendritic branches are going to be fewer in number, like this neuron here that's pictured. The second major domain of the cell is the cell body. I'm a little annoyed by where my dot is here. The cell body is this whole triangular region, not just the central circular region. But the cell body tends to be similar to other cells in the body, in that there's a nucleus, there are other things that you might have heard about in high school or college biology classes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, all the organelles of a, of a cell are found, of a neuron are found in the cell body, along with the nucleus, which is where the DNA um, chromosomes are located. The third major domain is the axon. Axons can be extremely long. So you have a, a neuron that has its cell body in the bottom of your spinal cord, and an axon that reaches all the way down to the muscle of your big toe. So that's like two and a half foot long neuron. Um, and most of the length of that neuron is this axon. Because axons are, as, we'll, as you read about, are specialized for sending electrical signals. Because neurons are very long, but because they have to send messages very quickly, I mean, think of stepping on uh, a pebble and pulling your foot back reflexively because that hurt. Um, if it took, you know, uh, an hour for that signal to get down there, because it's just some kind of floating signal through the neuron, you know, you'd hurt yourself and you'd never pull your foot back. So these electrical signals are designed to carry messages very, very quickly. It takes about a tenth of a second for that signal to go from the base of your spinal cord to your big toe when, when it's electrical in nature. So axons are, are designed to do that. Then they're facilitated in doing that by being wrapped in 
the white matter substance that we talked about before. It's an insulation that improves electrical signaling. And your, your chapter may have talked about that, but again, that's not terribly relevant to our class. What you need to know is that the electrical signals travel down the axon. And then they travel to all of the branches of the axon, which might be quite numerous in some neurons, until they reach the nerve terminal. So this cell is pictured as having, I don't know, something like 12 nerve terminals here uh, at, at the end of different branches of this axon. It's the terminals that then interact with some other neuron, or it could be a muscle cell or a cell from a gland or something like that. But, but basically, this is where the synapses are. It's between the terminal of one neuron, which is the sending neuron, and the dendrites of another neuron, which is the receiving neuron. Or again, it could be a muscle cell or something like that. So this is where all of the critical interactions occur. This is where neurotransmitters are released. This is where messages are sent that are either excitatory or inhibitory. Um, and that's, I think this the kind of information is going to be covered on this slide here. The electrical signals being sent within neurons are called action potentials. They're very fast and very reliable. When an action potential reaches the nerve terminal, the terminal secretes a neurotransmitter across the synapse, which then interacts with neurotransmitter receptors on the receiving signal, on the receiving neuron. And the, depending on the shape of those receptors, basically, and how they're connected to other things inside that neuron, details we don't need to worry about, that will either increase the likelihood that this cell will have an electrical signal or decrease the likelihood. Increasing likelihood is called excitation. Decreasing likelihood is called inhibition. Okay, so here's a picture of another neuron. Again, they're all shaped very differently. And I've got these stars here. And I've got some red stars and some blue stars. To make the point that any single neuron um, likely has dozens to hundreds of synapses at different places on different dendrites across the cell. Some of those, let's say the red stars, are excitatory synapses. So any signals being transmitted here will make it more likely for this neuron to send a signal down the road. And any synapses, let's say the blue ones, which are communicating inhibitory messages, will make it less likely that this neuron will send its own signal. So let's imagine that this is some um, motor neuron that's going to command a muscle to activate. So whenever a signal is being sent here, I'm going to get a muscle contraction somewhere in my body. Let's just embed this neuron for the sake of argument in a reflex that would cause me to, um, to raise my hand and wave at somebody. So any information in my brain that suggests to me that I know that person, that I want to talk to that person, that I want to get that person's attention would make me do this. And any information um, in my brain right now that would make me think, I don't know who that person is, or I'm, I don't want to talk to that person right now, would inhibit my behavior of waving my hand. And so if you can think of like, spotting somebody and you think you know them, you're not quite sure, you don't want to embarrass yourself by waving at somebody that you don't actually know, but you don't want to miss the chance to acknowledge somebody that you do actually know, you might be feeling that war of excitation and inhibition in your behavioral circuits that, you know, I'm oversimplifying this obviously, but, but all of our behaviors, point I'm making is all of our behaviors are going to be this this culmination of excitatory and inhibitory signals, some of which might be very strong. I mean, sometimes you can see the person clearly. You definitely know them. You definitely like them. So your inhibitory signals are not being sent and only your excitatory signals are being sent. No problem. Other times it may be very clear. I don't know that person. So only your inhibitory signals are being sent. No excitatory signals. But other times it might be unclear. I think I know that person. That kind of person kind of looks familiar. Kind of want to talk to that person. And then there may be this debate and you'll either end up embarrassing yourself or having a successful interaction or not knowing one way or the other because of the result of all of that computation. All right. So in the next video of this lecture, um, we are going to put neurons like this and decision making processes like this in a much more um, concrete way.
situation, behavioral situation, and we'll be able to start thinking about the ways in which information is processed in the nervous system.